Welcome to the Frontier AETC Project ECHO. I'm Kent Unruh and I'd like to turn it over to our medical director, Dr. Brian Wood, for the talk today. Thanks everybody for coming. My goal today is to review some of the clinical data for tenofovir alafenamide, or TAF. We've talked about TAF here on ECHO here and there, and we did a bit of review after ID week, but I'm gonna try to review a couple of the clinical trials that have been published. I want to be clear that I don't have any conflicts of interest or financial disclosures. I present this mostly because I think it's clinically relevant and questions are coming up a lot here on ECHO and in clinic. So this is what I'm going to try to cover today in probably 20 minutes or so. First, what is TAF and what is all the fuss about? Second, a brief summary of the clinical trials to date and ongoing, the formulation that has been approved so far and the indications for that formulation and I'll review three of the clinical trials which have been published so far. I find it hard to talk about TAF without using a lot of abbreviations and sort of alphabet soup, so I'll do my best to be clear which abbreviations and which drug names I'm talking about, and here's a short list if, for your reference if you're coming back to these slides later. So first, what is TAF and what is all the fuss about? So here's a slide that I adapted from something David Spock uses, and first, Here's the blue pill of TDF, or tenofovir disaproxyl fumarate, which is the form of tenofovir we have been giving for years. So it is the form that is in Truvada, in all the single tablet regimens. To date, it's the formulation we have been using for years that we commonly refer to as tenofovir. But it's abbreviated as TDF, and that's what's actually in the co-formulations. And TDF gets into the plasma, becomes tenofovir, which gets delivered to lymphoid cells and then converted to the active metabolites. TAF, on the other hand, so here's our TAF pill, does not get converted to tenofovir until it gets to the target cells, so until it gets to lymphoid cells, PBMCs, also hepatocytes. It gets converted by this enzyme called cathepsin A. So what's the big deal? So what we know from clinical trials, like the first trial we'll talk about, is what you end up with is 90% or so lower levels of tenofovir, and we think this ends up being lower levels of the active, active drug in the places you don't want it. So much lower levels in the plasma, hence lower levels in the kidneys, lower levels in the bones, and theoretically less long-term side effects. And we'll look at what the clinical trials have shown so far. We also know from the trials that you get about four times higher levels of the active drugs in the places you want it, places like lymphocytes. The other advantage that's been described is TAF can be given in very low dose, which makes it easy to co-formulate. I've also seen it written that because it is such a low dosage, maybe this will make it less costly to produce and maybe more cost effective, especially in resource limited settings. I have a feeling that is not going to lead to much cost benefit here in this country knowing our system, but maybe in the future for production in resource limited places, maybe there will be cost benefit. So a brief summary of some of the phase three trials that have been finished or are ongoing, and I'll start with phase three trials of Elvitegravir, Cobacistat, FTC, Tenofovir elephenamide, or ECF-TAF. So this is Genvoya, which we'll be talking more about. First, trials for HIV treatment. So there were two trials, which we will talk about, that compared ECF-TAF to ecf TDF, so this is Genvoya versus Strybild, in treatment-naive patients. There was a switch study, which we will also talk about, to ECF-TAF, or Genvoya, from standard TDF-containing regimens. There's a switch trial to ECF-TAF, or Genvoya, in the setting of renal impairment. And these first three we're going to talk about in more detail today because they have been published. Then there was this switch study to ECF-TAF, or Genvoya, plus daily darunavir to replace salvage ART. This study was presented at ID Week and we did review it briefly in our ID Week review back in October. So if this is coming up, feel free to go back to that ECHO talk. I think it was October 15th and I'm sure we will review it in more detail when cases come up or when it is published. But today we're going to focus on these first three. I want to mention a couple other ongoing phase three HIV treatment trials just to show the other formulations that are being studied. So there is a switch study to FTC-TAF from our traditional FTC-TDF or Truvada 
both with a standard third ARV agent. There is a switch to this RF TAF or Ropivirine FTC TAF, so this is Complera-like, replacing TDF with TAF, and they're switching from either Complera or a Tripla. There's this other formulation that combines Darunavir, boosted with Cobacistat, with FTC and TAF being studied in treatment naive or experienced individuals. So this is kind of an exciting pill that has, will have a very high barrier to resistance, hopefully less long-term renal and bone dysfunction, with the biggest downside, I think, that it will have the COBE drug interactions and GI side effects. And this other formulation, and I had a little bit of trouble determining whether this is in phase two or phase three, it's somewhere in that transition right now, I think we'll see phase two data soon, comparing this new integrase inhibitor 9883 combined with FTC TAF in treatment naive or experienced patients. It's being compared to dolutegravir plus FTC or TAF. So we'll see those soon and we'll see at least I think FTC TAF and Ropivirine FTC TAF likely approved later this year and the others further down the line. I want to mention these other phase three trials for hepatitis B treatment because this comes up as well. So there are these two studies comparing TAF to TDF for hep B mono infection, both treatment naive and treatment experienced, uh, both E antigen positive and negative patients. And there was a press release from Gilead last month giving some of the preliminary data and TAF did look very effective for hep B mono infection. And this switch trial to ECF TAF or Genvoya for HIV hep B co-infection was about 75 patients. Our friend Joel Gallant led this and presented some preliminary data from IAS 2015. So this is not an exhaustive list. There are some other trials. There is a treatment trial only in women because a lot of the other studies as we'll talk about did have difficulty recruiting women. Uh, there are a couple of other trials, but I think these are the main ones to be aware of. Here is the one formulation approved to date, which is ECF-TAF, Elvitegravir, Cobacistat, FTC, Tenofovir, Elephantamide approved in November. Here are the two indications in the package insert. One is for initial treatment for treatment naive individuals. The other is a switch or simplification strategy to replace the current regimen for those individuals with a suppressed viral load on a stable regimen for at least six months with no history of treatment failure and no resistance to the individual components of the drug. Here is a photo I took with my phone in clinic the other day just comparing the Genvoya tab to Strybuild in case you're curious about size. So you can see Genvoya is slightly smaller than Strybuild. I'll turn then to clinical trial data. So we're going to look at the three trials that have been published, the initial ART trial, the large switch trial, and then the switch in the setting of renal impairment. So starting with these two trials, and the data has been combined, comparing Genvoya to Strybild, so ECF-TAF to ECF-TDF, so the one agent different in these formulations is really the TAF versus TDF. And this is for initial therapy for treatment naive individuals. So these are both double blind randomized control trials in treatment naive HIV-1 infected adults with creatinine clearance above 50. Done, a multi-center trial done uh, across many countries. Individuals were randomized one to one to each study arm and the main outcome was proportion with HIV RNA less than 50 copies at 48 weeks as well as pre-specified renal and bone changes and then the results were stratified in a number of different subgroup analyses. And so participants received either ECF-TAF, which is Genvoya, plus a Strybild placebo, or ECF-TDF, which is Strybild, plus a Genvoya placebo, and you can see the numbers of participants here. I'll just go right to the data. The, I'm not showing the baseline characteristics. They were very well balanced. The one criticism of this trial, like uh, a lot of ARV treatment trials, is there was a very low rate of female participants in both arms. If we look at virologic efficacy at 48 weeks between what's in the blue bars is ECF-TAF or Genvoya, what's in the green bars is ECF-TDF or Strybuild, you can see overall no statistically significant difference. The authors comment that these are very high virologic rates in both arms. There was a statistically significant difference in those with baseline HIV RNA below 100,000, although what I would say is these are still both pretty darn high efficacy rates. I'm not sure I make much of that. When they looked at the subgroup analysis of women in the trial, there was statistical superiority of Genvoya over Strybild, but again, numbers in those arms were very small. And again, I'm not sure we can really make much of that. My interpretation here is very high virologic efficacy rates in all of the arms and overall very comparable efficacy. I'll turn then to side effects because I think this is really where 
the money is at and where most of the interest is. Was TAF beneficial over TDF in terms of toxicity? So I'm going to break this first into renal changes here in the green box and then talk about bone changes and then lipids. What we're looking at here is median percent change from baseline in all of these rows except estimated GFR is just the actual numbers. The rest are median percent change from baseline. Here's ECF TAF, here's ECF TDF. There are some much nicer graphs of this in the paper if you want to look at those and I've summarized them just for simplicity's sake. So remember these are all treatment naive individuals getting these regimens as their first ART therapy ever. So they're all starting cobacystat anew. So we can predict they'll likely have a some slight decline in estimated G GFR just from the expected cobacystat effect. And they did see that in both arms. Here was the change in estimated GFR in both arms, both of which happened within two weeks and then remained stable. It was less in the TAF arm. If this was cobacystat effect, how do you explain that? I'm not totally sure the answer to that. I think what the authors comment on is both of these changes happened immediately, then were stable, and most likely were due to cobacystat. But there was some favoring of TAF here. What's of more interest, I think, is these markers of proximal tubule dysfunction. And if we look at those changes from baseline to 48 weeks, things like urine protein to creatinine ratio, retinol binding protein, beta-2 microglobulin, these very sensitive markers of proximal tubule dysfunction, you'll see those changes did favor TAF in a statistically significant manner over TDF. You can see the rises in these over 48 weeks in the TDF arm and overall not much change, but certainly better in the TAF arm. What does this mean? It's hard to know. There were no discontinuations in either arm for proximal tubule dysfunction. This is only 48 weeks of follow-up, which is one limitation of the data. Now, if we look at bone mineral density, what we know from prior studies is anytime you start somebody for their first regimen on ART, you expect a bone mineral density decline in the first year with any ART. And we see that here. However, that decline is less in the TAF arm. Again, this is only 48 weeks of data. We don't have clinical events like osteoporotic fractures. But I think what we can take from this is at least those markers of proximal tubule dysfunction and bone mineral density appear to be better and appear to favor the TAF arm somewhat. If we look at lipids, we see the opposite effect. So again, you're starting these people anew on ART. You do expect lipids to rise. And what you see here is lipid increases in every type of marker that are higher in the TAF arm than in the TDF arm. We know that TDF has some, as Joel Gallant said in his ACC, accidental lipid lowering effects. So we do think TDF lowers lipids to some degree and we see less lipid rise in those on TDF. <laughs> However, the authors and the investigators sort of minimize that. They comment that there really was no difference in those who initiated lipid modifying agent. And although all these lipid markers rise, the total cholesterol to HDL ratio really wasn't that much different. So again, how clinically significant is this? I don't think we know. We don't have long-term follow-up for cardiovascular events or anything like that. But I will give a little nod to TDF and say I think the lipid changes favor TDF to some degree. So then let's look at switching from TDF to TAF, and we talked about this a little after ID week, but this has now been published, so I want to come back to this. So this is a randomized study, although open label, so different than that first study in that this is not double blind, this is open label, and I think that's important for switch studies. This is HIV infected adults with HIV RNA below 50 copies for at least 48 weeks on a TDF containing regimen, which notably was their first regimen, all with eGFR above 50, this is the largest switch study to date, so over 1,400 patients. And here's the breakdown of their TDF baseline regimen. Randomized two to one to either switch to ECF TAF, again, that is Genvoya, or stay on their current TDF-based regimen. Here is virologic efficacy, and then we'll look at side effects first. And this compares in the blue bar, ECF TAF or Genvoya, to the green bar, which is staying on the prior TDF regimen. You can see overall, comparing all prior TDF containing regimens, prior a tripla, prior TDF FTC of or prior TDF 
FTC plus boosted atazanavir. There is statistical superiority of ECF TAF or Genvoya. However, I would caution you in interpreting that as superiority. Again, this is an open label switch study. I think there's inherent bias to these type of switch studies. Patients often enroll because they want to switch. They know if they've switched to Genvoya or not. They can tell what they are on. So the authors do comment that this statistical difference in virologic efficacy was not driven by virologic failure, for example. It was really driven by tolerability and probably was driven by perceived, side, perceived or real side effects to efavirenz or boosted atazanavir. So again, I interpret this as both have very high virologic efficacy rates and I caution with you with the interpretation of the statistically significant difference. When they compared ECF-TAF to ECF-TDF, so now we're only changing the tenofovir component, virologic efficacy was quite similar. And if we look at just this arm and the data from ID Week that looks at side effects, so now we're only comparing TAF versus TDF, we see very similar trends to what I showed you in that first trial for treatment naive individuals. So again, this is percent change from baseline to 48 weeks, ECF TAF or ECF TDF, and you can see all of the renal parameters favor TAF. There were minor changes in serum creatinine. I think these are pretty minimal changes, but it did favor TAF. The markers of proximal tubule dysfunction again favored TAF. The markers of bone mineral density changes also favored TAF. I think what's notable here is that these people had already been on TDF for a year or more, and if you follow them for another year, they continue to lose bone mineral density, whereas if you switch to TAF, they actually gain bone mineral density a bit. Again, we don't have clinical events like fractures, but I think this is pointing towards a trend of favoring TAF in terms of long-term side effects. Similarly, if we look at lipid data, I think this favors TAF, uh, sorry, excuse me, favors TDF. You see larger rises in lipids with TAF. Again, the investigators sort of minimize that, point out that total cholesterol to HDL ratio isn't much different, and those who start a lipid modifying agent isn't much different. Finally, let's look at switching to TAF in the setting of renal impairment. We've talked about a couple cases recently where this was pertinent. Uh, here in ECHO, and this study has been published in preliminary form, and I think is worth looking at. So this is a single arm open label safety and efficacy trial that enrolled HIV infected adults with suppressed viral load for at least six months, who had an EGFR of 30 to 69, though they did have some inclusion criteria that required that that GFR be stable, and they defined that as no change in renal function or medical management of renal disease for at least the prior three months. So these are not people who in the prior three months had rapidly worsening renal dysfunction. They had renal insufficiency that was largely stable. They switched from their prior regimen to ECF-TAF or Genvoya, Overall, it was 242 individuals. And here I will show the baseline characteristics because I think this is pertinent. One thing I will point out that although this trial included people with GFR of 30 to 70, those who actually had GFR below 50 was a much lower proportion, only 80. So it's a, fair, it's a smaller N that actually had significant renal dysfunction. The other things I'll point out, about 65% were on TDF as part of their prior regimen. There were moderate rates of other comorbidities that can cause renal dysfunction. The median GFR overall in the study by these calculations was in the mid 50s and somewhere in the low to mid 40s in terms of percentage of overall participants had what the investigators defined as significant proteinuria or albuminuria. <coughs> they really don't say or have a way to comment on how many had true suspected or confirmed tenofovir proximal tubulopathy before the switched. And I think that makes it a little hard to interpret. Again, there's better graphs in the paper if you wanna look at those, but I've just summarized the data in a table here. And we'll look first at just changes in EGFR, and this is the total group of participants, those with EGR less than 50, those with EGFR above 50, those who switched from a TDF-containing regimen or from a non-TDF-containing regimen. And the punchline here is there really was no appreciable change in EGFR after the switch in any of the subgroups. So why is that? Why didn't EGFR improve? I think it's hard to know. Again, not all the participants were on TDF, 
A lot of them had other causes of renal insufficiency that were not TDF related. We don't really know how many had true TDF proximal tubulopathy. Many of these people were switching from a non cobacystat containing regimen to cobacystat, so I think that makes the interpretation more difficult. I don't really know what we can say about why EGFR didn't improve with that switch or if that's meaningful. If we look at markers of proximal tubulopathy, these did change in a meaningful way, in a statistically significant way, largely driven by those who switched from a TDF containing regimen. So you can see all of these markers that of proximal tubule dysfunction that's improved in a statistically significant way after changing from a TDF containing regimen. Again, we don't have long-term follow-up for clinical events. I'm not going to show the bone mineral density changes or the lipid changes because they largely agreed with the prior studies. So here's my summary. TAF consistently demonstrates high virologic efficacy with improvements in markers of proximal tubulopathy and bone mineral density when compared to TDF. Lipids do increase on TAF or a worse on TAF compared to TDF. I think all of this is of unclear long-term clinical significance. So I've heard really two different takes on this. So the glass half full perspective is what I'll call it. This is a promising advance in ART, offers significant improvements over TDF that will lead to fewer long-term adverse events, especially as our patients age. And then the other perspective I've heard, which I'll call the glass half empty perspective, follow-up time is limited in the clinical trials, does not include clinically significant events like fractures or proximal tubulopathy causing discontinuations or cardiac events from the lipids. And perhaps as with TDF, it will take years to know if TAF causes clinically significant renal impairment or not. So two different perspectives. I think I'll end there, see if there's questions. 